Good day. It's hard to say whether it's good morning or good afternoon because we will be slipping very shortly over to the afternoon. So good day. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting and very challenging and thought-provoking time together. My name is Kate Quinn, and I am the, uh, the chairperson of Edmonton Sexual Exploitation Working Group. And I also work for CEASE, the Center to End All Sexual Exploitation. So I will be your moderator for the day. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Edmonton rests on Treaty 6 land. And that together, all of us who find ourselves here in 2015 are working together to live in right and respectful relationships. I'd like to welcome those who are of Indigenous heritage who are here today. I'd also like to acknowledge that some here today may well have experienced sexual exploitation, sexual assault, and other indignities to their bodies. We want to create a safe space. If there is anyone who is uh, saddened or triggered by anything, we do have counselors in the uh, audience here today, per, uh, and they could go with you out to a quiet place. If anyone who is a counselor or a support work and worker could just raise your hand, that would be great. So you know that you have support. I'd also like to recognize that there may be some in this room who have experienced homelessness, who've experienced hunger, who have experienced social exclusion. You are very welcome here. I'm proud about our public library and how it creates that welcoming space. I'm proud about the fact that our city and Homeward Trust have invested in community social workers to ensure that in this public space, all are welcome and all are safe. I'd like to uh, draw some attention to some colors. You will see people wearing orange ribbons or I'm wearing a vest with a lot of orange in it. There's an orange scarf here. That's because we are situated within the 16 days of activism to end violence against girls and women. It began November 26 and it concludes with December 10th, International Human Rights Day. I'd also like to acknowledge that in our midst, there are those who work very actively in, as leadership uh, guides in our community for human rights, the John Humphrey Center team. I'd also like to recognize that there are frontline workers here, Kindred House, DEXA, Crossroads, perhaps Métis Child and Family Services, others who are working that very frontline work. There are counselors here who are engaged in that work of helping heal individuals, families, and communities. We have members of our law enforcement here. We have concerned citizens who take action by coming to events like this to learn and to see what they can do as an individual or as a part of a community. And we have many others uh, whom I don't know. So I'm, it's good to be here because we're going to be, again, looking into uh, what causes pain in our world, but what builds hope. Within this time, you also see that over here we have a red dress, which uh, you will hear more about at the end of our time together. But the red dress symbolizes all of the indigenous women who are murdered and who have not yet been found. And the, the white bear, bear of comfort, a spirit bear perhaps, and a candle to remember all those whose lives have been lost through sexual exploitation. I would just like to remind us that in Edmonton alone, and this happens in every city, big or small in our country, there are women, sexually exploited women, who are murdered, and sadly some whose bodies have not yet been found. In Edmonton, just since the early 80s, we know that there are at least 40 murders of women. We, I say at least because I only use numbers that have been verified by the Edmonton Police Service and the media, but we know there are many others whose deaths have not been verified. 11 of those 40 are solved. That means 29 are not solved. This summer, and, and I remember very well the, actually the year of 2004, and we, for, we went through so many hard years where it just seemed that 
every month there was a woman's body being found outside of uh, the city of Edmonton in the fields around. In 2004, there were four young women who were murdered. One young woman's body was found, Rachel Quinney. The other two women were just found this year in 2015. Corey Ottenbright and Dolores Brower. Their remains were found together. There's one young woman who is still missing. Her family has not known what has happened to her. So we carry these stories with us all the time in this work to bring about change. I was in Calgary this weekend with my mother and the headlines were, Christopher Dunlop gets 13 years for death of Laura Furlan. Laura Furlan was choked to death and then thrown into a creek in 2009. Her mother says, my focus is on her whole life, not just that evening. There was a person out there with her on the street who had never seen her before. I don't think this guy is a monster, but that's what ended up happening that night. He chose a vulnerable woman who he ultimately choked to death in what ultimately became an aggravated sexual assault under the criminal code. And then he dumped her body under a tree near a berm in the park. This is the reality within which our guest will speak uh, today. I would like to tell you just a few more things before I in invite uh, Rachel Moran to speak. The Sexual Exploitation Working Group has been a leadership group working in our city since 2004. It is part of REACH Edmonton Council for Safe Communities uh, as our backbone community organization for community safety. I'd like to give a special thanks to the REACH staff and volunteers who did all the work to organize this day and to REACH for purchasing 50 copies of Rachel's book. And I know the first 50 people who were here had their copies. She will uh, be uh, uh, happy to sign them at the end of our time together. I'm also proud to acknowledge that the library has five copies plus a streaming audio book. So if you weren't one of the fortunate ones who got the complimentary copies, you can take them out from our library. The Sexual Exploitation Working Group members include ACT Alberta, Alberta Human Services Addictions and Mental Health, the Protection of Sexually Exploited Children Act team, Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Services, Catholic Social Services, Protection of Sexually Exploited Children Community Follow-up Worker, CEASE, Child and Family Services, again with a focus on protection of sexually exploited children, the City of Edmonton, our City Council Liaison, City of Edmonton Community Services, our Edmonton Police Services Vice Section, REACH Edmonton, the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, and the Family Center. I told Rachel I was, I was nervous because I was sure I was going to forget something, and I, I think I probably will. So I'm going to try to remember uh, the housekeeping. The washrooms are out there somewhere if you need. Just uh, <laughs> I, I did forget to find out where they are, but, but we, we have them. So. Also, I know some people are tweeters, and so if you are a tweeter, you are welcome to tweet. And again, the, this whole movement of the 16 days of activism, uh, one of the calls was to orange the world, so one of the Twitter handles is hashtag orange the world. Uh, another hashtag by the Status of Women Canada is hashtag end violence. Uh, you can go to the Status of Women web page and you can sign the pledge to end violence against girls and women. Our sexual exploitation working group has a hashtag. It's hashtag YEG talk sexploit. So if you are in that world, you can contribute to, to building a social media ripple with our talk today. And I would like to again say thanks to Reach Edmonton because they are live streaming this presentation. And for those who were not able to come in person today, the webcast will be available afterwards. I'd like to welcome Rachel. She's sitting here today. She's come all the way from Dublin, Ireland. She was in Vancouver for a few days 
and came to Edmonton for about a day and a half uh, on her way then to other talks. So we're very fortunate that she's been able to come. She's a, a woman who has transformed her experiences into action. And that's the call for each one of us. Whatever life experiences we have, how can we move into action to create a healthier, safer community for all of us? So she has written a book, which you'll uh, hear her speak about, but more as important as writing that book is the moving us all to action. So uh, I would like to invite her to come because she can tell her story much better. She will speak to you about Space International and some of the work that women are doing. And um, welcome to Rachel. She'd also like to... She'd like to sit because she's been on her feet a lot. So. Can you hear me? Yeah, Grant. <laughs> Don't mind Kate, by the way. I'm just lazy. That's all it is. <laughs> I just prefer to sit when I'm talking. I always have. Um, so first of all, thank you all for, for coming here to hear me today. Um, people are always thanking me for going to speak, but it would be a strange and pointless thing if any of us were sitting up here with a whole load of empty seats. So it's great to see the good tour now here today. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit and I'm going to read a bit and then I'm, I'm going to open up um, a Q&A, which I hope will be in a conversational style so that we can ask questions um, you can ask questions of me and, and we can ask questions maybe of each other and of ourselves and of the societies that, that we are living in. And I'm assuming that most of you are locals living here in Edmonton. Um, but I've done a lot of traveling and what I've seen all over the world is the same situation replicated and played out just everywhere. Um, and I've, I've said um, numerous times in, in the last days since I've been here in, in, in Vancouver and in Edmonton that Canada is really, it's, it's absolutely typical of what I've seen everywhere else in that when I go to the US, I see um, a huge overrepresentation of black women and, and girls in prostitution. Here in Canada, I see a huge overrepresentation of native um Excuse me, I, I'm told or was warned that the word native has a derogatory ring to it in this country. Where I come from, it doesn't. It simply means a person from a place. So that was something I shouldn't have let slip out of me. Um, indigenous women and girls are hugely overrepresented here in this country in the sex trade, and that is not a coincidence. But I, it's in line with, as I said, what I see everywhere, which is that people who are from marginalized populations and certainly in colonized countries. They don't just land up as generations pass in prostitution and being exploited in numerous ways by accident. These are hangovers of colonialism. And um, I know in my country, we have had a lot of problems. Although Ireland is a funny kind of place or was when I was growing up in that, because it was, it was a Caucasian country, everybody was the same color we didn't have the complication of, of um, the problems that you see when you have people who are positioned in uh, what we would have called, I suppose, socially vulnerable positions because of their ethnicity and their race. So when you're somewhere like North America, you see the, the complexity of these issues and how deeply intertwined they are but in a country like Ireland, where I grew up, where everybody is the same colour, you can see class more clearly, if you understand what I mean. Because you can see the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Like, everybody's the same colour. Almost everybody's the same religion. They were in the Republic, anyway, where I was from. Um, so you can see that some people have a lot, some people have a reasonable amount, and some people have very close to nothing. And that's the case all over the world. And in Ireland... Um, our situation was that uh, we also, the prostituted population, came from the segment of Irish society that had very close to nothing. And the young girls that I met in prostitution, and we were all in our teens, um, 
they were girls who I either had met in the hostels because I was put into residential care or they were girls who I had met through other girls who were in the hostels. So we were all from that same echelon. We were all from that, that lower social orders, um, if you like. And that's something that I like to bring up and to point out because people very often pretend that prostitution is an issue of choice. And it may be an issue of choice for some small minority of women, but it's certainly not an issue of choice for the vast majority. For the vast majority, they're there precisely for the reason that they had no choice. And some people will get confused and bamboozled on that, and they will say, well, unless you were sex trafficked in the most, uh, in the purest form of the term, in that, you know, unless you had a gun put to your head or you were kidnapped or you were chained to a radiator, well, then you did have some degree of choice. But I don't believe that we should talk about um, choice without talking about the presence or absence of viable choice. Look, is a choice really viable? If you're choosing between eating a meal and giving a blowjob, is that, is that a viable choice? It's not. And I think we know it's not. And um, so I, anyway, I left home to give you a brief overview of my history. I left home in the, in the spring of 1990. I'd just turned 14 years of age. And um, I spent from the spring of that year till the summer of the following year in and out of all sorts of different residential care homes. Um, I was in one foster home. I was in, um, I was in, under, I was in uh, battered wives shelters because they ran out of places to put me. So some of the places were, the placements were very inappropriate. Um, and that was absolutely the case. It was just very typical. All of the, the young girls went through that. It was like this kind of Ferris wheel where you just bounced from pillar to post all over the place. And it was from that place of vulnerability that myself and so many other um, young girls ended up in prostitution. And in, in my case, I'd been homeless for, for some time. I'd been homeless on and off for um, just over a year. And... Eventually, um, I met this young man, which is very often the way that it happens, and um, I was in prostitution within the week. So I just would like people to really challenge that, because I know that the dominant narrative now is very much about choice and consent. And we have this normalization of what prostitution is that's... Um, been very deliberately framed and it's been framed through the misuse, the deliberate misuse of language. So I'm going to read a couple of pages of this book um, that I'd like, I'd like to read from this particular chapter. It's called The Normalization of Prostitution because I'd like people to understand that this idea of, of sanitizing and normalizing prostitution was utterly necessary and very deliberate and and it was understood that it was necessary because you cannot actually go on to to defend something um, something as harmful and damaging as prostitution unless you first normalize it and try to strip it of that, that harm and that damage. And I've prefaced every one of these chapters with a quote. Um, and the quote on this one is um, from Jane Fonda's autobiography. And she had said, it's hardest to see what's wrong about what seems normal. I thought that that was a very simple, short, but profound, intensely profound sentence and that it really belonged at the top of this chapter. Because if we think back over, over world history and we look at some of the most absolutely horrifying practices imaginable, it's important, I think, to remind ourselves that so many people during those times just thought that these things were normal. They just accepted them as the fabric, part of the fabric of society. Um, and I think there was also the, the horrible mistake that people made, which was to accept these things as inevitable. And I don't believe that we should ever accept any form of oppression as inevitable. And I further believe that every lousy, legislative framework that was ever put in place on the earth to deal with these kind of issues started out from that place, that place of accepting oppression as inevitable. So I think we need to be very, very careful about that. So anyway, 
For prostitution to be normalized, it must be sanitized. Its inherently harmful nature must, at all costs, be concealed. It could not be considered normal otherwise. Several tactics are used to achieve this. The first I will discuss is the not-so-subtle terminology which has been deliberately introduced in recent decades with the aim of attempting to frame prostitution as ordinary work. The terms sex worker and sex work sound unnatural, and they sound unnatural because they suggest a correlation which is unnatural. Human nature is not attuned to an association between sex and work. However, though they inevitably strike the listener as odd, they do not shock with the potency of terms like prostitution and prostitute, which conjure up all the mental imagery fitting to a sexually exploitative exchange. The imagery sex worker calls to mind is of a woman in a sanitized situation, a masseuse's table perhaps, with clean cotton sheets and soft fluffy towels, a uniform necessarily, something akin to a nurse's but with a much shorter skirt, white of course and matching spotlessly white tissues to wipe the semen off the floor. Everything is clean in the imagery this terminology suggests. Everything is above board and proper and sanitized. But when we look at the actuality of what a sex worker does, that is when we see the snag. The semen is the fly in the ointment, the singular clue that there is something not quite professional going on here. And its significance is not perceived as diluted by the disinfected imagery that surrounds it. Rather, the starkness of this contrast belies the notion of ordinary work here. There are many aspects of prostitution that make it incongruent with the term work, but one of the most important and telling of these is that it is the only form of so-called work in which a person is both the service provider and the product at the same time. As one prostitution survivor responded to the claim that prostitution is no better or worse than flipping burgers at McDonald's, she said, in McDonald's, you're not the meat. In prostitution, you are the meat. The term sex worker is a rhetorical weapon in the normalization of prostitution. No doubt there are those whose agenda would be served if society wholly embraced it. But I have yet to hear a person, conversationally, with no agenda behind it, say sex worker when they mean prostitute. The term sex worker was received with a knowing snigger among the prostitutes I've known, including myself. We were all very well aware of its objective and equally aware of the pointlessness of trying to achieve it. Prostitutes and former prostitutes are instinctively attuned to these blatant attempts at whitewash. We know that they are not designed to dignify the women in prostitution. We know that they are designed to dignify prostitution itself. Further to that, we know that they are about as useful as tits on a bull, and we know it from the most reliable source of all, personal experience. Trying to frame prostitution as legitimate and normal work opposes logic on innumerable levels, one of the most obvious and almost laughable being that European Union health and safety legislation prohibits sexual harassment, violence, and work that causes work-related stress. Needless to say, these negatives and many more besides are so intrinsically entrenched here as to be understood by those in prostitution as occupational hazards. Obviously because I have suffered and survived the realities of prostitution, but also I believe it is because I love words and writing that I find it so hard to stomach the message of those who try to misshape the prostitution experience through the deliberate distortion of language. Luckily, these messages are prone to contradiction. Many groups deny the intrinsic harm of prostitution, while at the same time advocating a harm reduction approach. If prostitution is not violence towards women, and if it is not harmful, then what harm is it they are proposing to reduce? How can any group commit to combating harm if they strive to deny the harm exists in the first place? That discrepancy was birthed at the starting point, in the moment the harmful nature of prostitution was denied. Another of the tactics in the normalization of prostitution is the attempt to divide prostituted women into two separate camps, those who are supposedly free and those who are forced. 
first referring to those women who have been enslaved bodily, who have been duped, often trafficked, forcibly detained, raped by their pimps and then sold as sexual meat to a succession of strangers. And free, of course, indicating those women who have supposedly exercised free will and are happy as larks with their lot. It would be useful to question why, if prostitution is a choice for women which can be taken with such ease, so many women have to be deceived and enslaved in order to do it. The prostitution experience of the trafficked woman most commonly involves force, followed by the trauma of commercial sexual abuse. The prostitution experience of the non-trafficked woman most commonly involves coercion, followed by the trauma of commercial sexual abuse. Both of these situations are reactionary. Both result in sexual abuse as a result of something that preceded them. And both share the consequence of a woman having sex with strangers that she has no desire to have. Precisely because these women's situations have been so divided in the popular consciousness by way of focusing on the differences that set them apart, attitudes towards them have been correspondingly divided. The woman who has been physically forced may be the focus of pity and compassion. By distinct comparison, the woman who has been coerced by life circumstances is the subject of criticism and derision. It is not the end place, then, that frames the nature of the attitudes towards them. It is the route by which they got there. A woman is derided as a whore if, like myself, she came to prostitution from a place of homelessness paired with male manipulation. But had I been duped to go to a foreign country under the promise of a non-existent au pair job and physically confined once I got there, I would have found myself the recipient of a very different attitude. This is difficult for me to know. Its very unfairness makes it difficult because it is the woman who was not physically forced who has a far greater weight of inwardly directed shame to deal with. It is a shame that rests on the charge of her perceived culpability. Had I been forced, I could comfort myself with that knowledge at least. I could partake in the blameless mentality of the victim, free of guilt or accountability, with no questioning shadows flickering at the back of my mind and no internal voices whispering, could you not have found another way? I could offer a short retort to anyone who dared say, and there are very many who dare say, well, nobody forced you to do it. The woman who was trafficked can say, well, actually, somebody did force me to do it. She can outwardly direct her rec recriminations, and she can look outside of herself rather than inside herself for answers. Women like myself who were forced by no body need to find our voices and assert that this does not mean we were forced by no thing. It is a very human foolishness to insist on the presence of a knife or a gun or a fist in order to recognize the existence of force, when often the most compelling forces on this earth present intangibly in coercive situations. My prostitution experience was coerced. For those of us who fall into the free category, it is life that does the coercing. People concentrate so much on the differences between prostituted women and trafficking victims that they forget there are far more similarities than differences. Probably the most fundamental of these is that while the trafficked woman had her sexual autonomy stolen from her, the prostituted woman had hers bought, and so both sets of women have lost their sexual self-governance. While individuals and organisations argue about whether the issues of trafficking and prostitution should be dealt with separately or together, the punters have already made their minds up. They use both sets of women and they make no distinction. So um, I'm just going to kind of run through a few bullet points in my mind um, about different things that I'd like I'd like people to think about, or maybe we could talk about when we get to the Q&A in the next few minutes. And, um, and that's one of them, I suppose, the concept of force in prostitution. And there's very many different forms of that. <coughs> and <coughs> what I don't think people understand is that when somebody comes into a brothel and, and hands you money and decides what it is that, that they want to do, there is this huge naivety out there and it's not 
it's not helped by the amount of lies that are coming out of the sex trade lobby. Um, I'd like people to be aware that what you're listening to when you listen to people from this lobby are people who are financially invested in keeping the sex trade going. And there's an enormous amount of dishonesty out there. And one of the most ridiculous um, things that we hear, and we hear quite regularly, is this, um, I choose my clients. Well, in seven years of prostitution, I never met a woman who chose her clients. And it's, we need to understand that this is, this is probably the ugliest expression of capitalism on the earth we're talking about here. Where does anybody get the idea that just in this area of capitalism alone, you can choose your clients? If you're running a Starbucks shop, you don't get to choose your clients. If you're running a, a butcher shop, you don't get to choose your clients. That doesn't happen in prostitution either. And I don't know why it is that, um, that people are so easily fooled into believing that, except outside of the, the obvious fact that if people are not in prostitution and they've never had any hand act or part in that life, it's much easier to be bamboozled by, by what it is that you're hearing. So I can absolutely assure you women don't choose their clients. I mean, if you get yourself, um, suppose you end up in a situation, get yourself is obviously the wrong phrase to use, if you end up in a situation where you're, you're beaten or you're raped or something extremely violent happens, of course you're going to try to avoid that particular man. But that's about as far as choosing your clients can go. And another thing that people don't understand is that the, the boundaries that you have um, as a woman in prostitution, the boundaries that you try to enforce, and all women in prostitution draw up a set of boundaries, um, lines of behavior over which they are, um, they try to be unwilling to allow men to go. But the, one of the real sicknesses, the, the way that sickness is expressed in prostitution, is the consistent pushback of the men who are paying you against those boundaries because quite a good number of them actively get off on doing things to you that they know you don't want. That is very, very common. So I think that because I, because I have a habit of answering questions at length, um, I think I might just open up the Q&A now because it's always my favorite part of any event. There's always enlightening things that people will say or will ask. Um, I realise that there will be people here who will disagree with me politically. Um, that's okay, as long as we can be respectful of each other. Um, and what I would ask is that nobody uses the term sex worker or sex work when they're speaking to me, because I have to tell you, I take that as a deliberate insult um, when I'm as clear as I am about where I stand on those terms and why I don't deal with them or use them or respond to them. So... Um, other than that, we're, we're free to disagree. So if anyone has any questions, now you can go ahead and ask them. I'll try to uh, moderate and make sure that I see hands. I, I just had a brilliant microphone. Oh, thanks. Here comes the microphone. Thanks for the brilliant presentation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Who has a question? <coughs> or an observation or a comment? Hi. Oh. Thank you so much for for sharing. Um, I guess I I have a question. Um, I've been going around the city and interviewing anybody who will talk to me, really, um, about criminalization, and um, and specifically, we're kind of working on a project around poverty and the criminalization of poverty. And I think this is a really um, important aspect that we need to look at, which is uh, those who are involved in prostitution and, and sexual exploitation and, and those who are, who are vulnerable. Um, and and the, the part that criminalization and criminalization of, of those who experience poverty uh, really plays into this added vulnerability. So I just thought very broadly, if you wanted to speak to that a little bit. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, <coughs> What we are calling for in the group that I work with that Kate mentioned earlier on, Space International, 
Um, one of the most important things we're calling for is the opening up of exit strategies, as we would frame it. And that is um, a call for a very broad package of service supports for people, for women and others in prostitution. So what we see, what we know from the evidence of our own lives, and also several of us are frontline service providers um, for women in the sex trade right now, so what we know is that women need help with housing, with childcare, with addiction services, uh, with counselling more generally, with education, with training. We know that they need income supports as to, to bridge them in the time period after they get out of prostitution. So that's one element in what we are calling for, which is the Nordic model. We are looking for um, the, the Nordic model as a legislative framework across our seven nations. We're from seven different countries, the membership of our group. And the Nordic model, for anybody who doesn't know, is, is the criminalization of those who pay to sexually access other people's bodies. It's gender neutral, so it protects everyone in prostitution, um, irrespective of their gender. And it also criminalizes anybody who's, who's buying sexual access to someone else's body, also irrespective of the gender of the exploiter. Um, which is exactly as it should be, but also kind of makes me laugh because, I mean, in the, the years I was in prostitution and all of the conversations I've had with women who've spent years working on this issue after having been in prostitution themselves, um, we never came across a female looking to buy sex. So I'm not saying those women don't exist. Um, what I'm saying is they're as rare as hen's teeth. Um, although we should certainly uh, criminalise any woman who, who um, exploits anyone else in just the same manner. So the Nordic model, that's what it does. It criminalises people who exploit sexually. It also criminalises people who exploit financially, so your pimps and your traffickers. Um, and it opens up those services. So we, we press for that model because as far as we're concerned, it's the only socialist, feminist, human rights-based justice on this earth in connection with this issue. And of course it has been massively pilloried by those who oppose us politically. Um, the major reason being that it has the, the effect of decreasing the sex trade. Um, that's their big beef with it really. It's, it's a, it collapses the market, it shrinks the market and that's, that's what their problem is. And I'm kind of thinking, well of course it decreases the market. That is the whole point, you know? Um, this is this is a human rights violation on a global scale. So of course we need to decrease that. That you know, it's like I say, it's the whole point of the matter. Um, but as to your question, and about the as far as the criminalisation of poverty is concerned, and the um, stepping on people because they've been stepped on already. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really get what you're saying, and that's part of. The, one of the bigger parts of the reason why we call for the Nordic model, because it opens up those exit strategies. It's non-judgmental. People are not criminalized for having been exploited already under that model. We're very, very clear and firm that nobody should ever be criminalized for their own exploitation, mm -hmm. which, like I say, is, is that's what really makes that model attractive to me, because it's the only one that, that clearly recognizes that, that people shouldn't be exploited for their own or shouldn't be criminalized for the rather for their own exploitation. You're never going to see that. I mean, you look back through history, that just did not exist anywhere. It's only now in, in these very recent times that, and that, that law is only 16 years old, which is nothing in comparison to the history of prostitution, which we've been dealing with for millennia. And it really is only now that we're starting to deal with it properly, finally. Um, and so the, that model began in Sweden 16 years ago, it's since moved into Norway, to Iceland, to Northern Ireland, which myself and some other Irish women I know were um, central in getting the legislation in the north of my country. Um, and it soon will be in the Republic where I'm from, we're told uh, either before this month is out or January at the latest, we'll have the Nordic model in the Republic of Ireland. So the model is on the move. It's very much on the table in France. It's been debated in France now for years. Um, people want this model. Um, people who are interested in social justice want this model. 
People who are interested in supporting and upholding the sex trade do not want this model. So we have this massive tug of war going on on the earth at the moment and a hell of a lot of lies being told. Um, and there are a lot of people out there who just flat out will not and would never recognise that this is actually a human rights based model. Um, because it, for them it, it's, it absolutely opposes their agenda. And, and, and so it should because their agenda is rancid from top to bottom. I have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I I um I just wanted to ask a question regarding um why sexual um exploitation or prostitution is legal. Like it's it's legal to be um an escort or like a street walking prostitute, but <coughs> the exploitation part of it is not legal. And I was just wondering, um, like I know it's very cruel and unfair. Do you mean under the Nordic model or under what framework are you talking about? Well, just about? I don't really know. Under like society, society's framework, it's just kind of not okay. really structured. So, right. Because yeah, I've just noticed that you can do kind of whatever you want, but there will be natural consequences to your actions, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, when I was, um, when I began in prostitution in 91, there was a situation where the police just seemed to look the other way and whatever went on on the streets was fair game. And that existed for about two and a half years until there was a, a change in the law in late um, 93, around November of 93, we were all running off the streets because you just couldn't step out on the street and make money anymore because um, the government had decided to criminalize um, but solicitation on the street. And that situation was supposedly, I mean, it was codified into law that it was illegal for both parties. But of course, it was the women who were arrested and hauled into police stations and the men were told to go on their merry way. Um, and I think that that's part of a bigger problem that a lot of women really need to wake up to. And I especially love when, when I meet young 20-something women, university-age-going women, who are politically savvy enough to see that this is part of a bigger, bigger problem. I mean, prostitution is a problem in and of its own right, of course, but it's also a symptom of a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we forget about that too. And the problem is where we as women are positioned in the gender hierarchy, and that is the real problem. And I think that that is what influences a lot of the policies that you're mentioning um, all over the earth. We, there is, as I said only at a meeting this morning, there is this, um, this acceptance um, of oppression, as I said here earlier too, as inevitable. And I think when people start out from that place, um, they, they say to themselves, you know, legislators and, and other policy advisors say to themselves, okay, this is always going to be with us, so what do we do about it? And they don't say to themselves, this has always been with us and we need to do something about it. They, they take you forward, they carry you forward into the next generations. And that's how they land up with these ridiculous policies, um, by just accepting what's wrong as what's usual, you know? And there's a difference, by the way, between something that's, something that's normal and something that's usual. It took me quite a while to get my head around the difference. Just because something is there all the time doesn't mean that it should be. Right. Hi, I want to thank you for being here today. And um, so I work in a, uh, as a case manager and a facilitator at uh, Exiting Strate Strategy uh, in a program at DEXA called Transitions. And um, so, from my understanding, that this is a pretty rare program. It, it's uh, in probably, from my understanding, it's the only one in Canada. And I'm wondering what is happening in Ireland in terms of exiting strategies and, and programs and supports for people who want to exit sexual exploitation. We only have one dedicated uh, team in the country that works with women affected by prostitution, and they work with women at all levels of the spectrum, like they'll work with women regardless whether they want to get out right now or whether they're still in or going to stay in. And uh, they'll work with women if they're out like 20 years and just want to have a conversation. So they work with all women in no matter way they've been affected by prostitution. 
Um, and what I think is w what's an issue for them, w which it's the same issue with women's groups everywhere I go, is this um, this funding problem that has just choking the life out of the services that they can provide. Um, it's just, it's just the same everywhere. We had a massive recession in Ireland as in everywhere, but it hit us really hard because we had um, been going through a lot of uh, growth, economic growth. So when that was very sharply and immediately reversed in OA, it hit funding services all right across the spectrum and it hit women's services particularly hard. But I do know that that group, um, they're called Ruhama, are working with 300 plus women per year. And you know, in a country that's as small as mine, our entire population um, of the Republic of Ireland is only 4.5 million. Um, so it's, it's a small country with a small population. But even so, there are up to a thousand women advertised for sale online in Ireland every single day. And the vast majority of them are young, impoverished, Eastern European women and other women, often, you know, Asian African women. Sometimes they can't even string a sentence of English together. And yet we're expected to believe that these women made their way from Africa, from, um, from Brazil, with quite, quite a, a strong number of women from that particular country for some reason. And <coughs> look, if, if a woman can't speak, look, if I can't speak a word of Brazilian, I can't go to bloody Brazil. It doesn't matter the fact that, you know, I'm not where I was at one point in my life and that I'm not, I'm not in abject poverty now. Um, how the hell are do these women are these women expected to be making their way across the globe? Our political opponents are telling us that they're migrant sex workers. They are trafficking victims, is what they are. So anyway, this is what we're up against in Ireland. We had this massive reversal back in the 90s um, when when I was in prostitution. We had almost 100% um, Irish women in the prostituted population, but with the economic growth I just mentioned, um, the numbers multiplied by many times. So we have as many Irish women as we ever had, but we also have 95% foreign women. So it's a much bigger market. Um, so it's, it's a real struggle to deliver services to women in a climate like that. And that's part of what we've been campaigning for for years to get, that, to get um, the political will to inject the funding into the services that the women need. Hi, I just had a question. Do you find that, um when women they get into this kind of like into prostitution that they like their morals and values go down and then they get into lust and greed and they're like more into like capitalizing themselves and that um, I don't know how to word it but you know like they capitalize on them or even other other women and like just their morals and values just go out the window and uh, <laughs> Sorry. You know, I think that, quite honestly, I don't really, I don't perceive the situation in that way. Um, when I was in prostitution, well, yeah, you could say my morals and values went out the window, but that was because I had to force them out the window. It wasn't because I wanted them to go there, do you know? It was an issue of exploitation. And when I look at young women and girls in the sex trade, what I see, um, I mean, if, you know, we're First of all, there's rampant narcotic addiction in, in many of their lives, as there was in mine. That, for me, wasn't an issue of morals and values, but more an issue of my wanting to escape mentally and emotionally from what I was experiencing every day. I can certainly see that it might look like an issue of morals and values to somebody who's perceiving the situation from an outside-in perspective, but they didn't know what was going on in my heart and mind. You know, I just wanted to get the hell out of there and I couldn't do that physically. So I did it in the only way that was available to me. And many, many, many women make that choice um, or are forced to make that choice. And I saw that in the lives of just most of the women that I knew. I only ever met one woman who didn't do drugs and prostitution. And she was a rampant alcoholic, you know. So it was really, I mean, I just don't see that. I don't see that this is... I do believe that your own personal morals and values may well become eroded, but that's a that's a byproduct. That's not the central core issue here. Um, I mean, when you when you deliberately hurt, when you when you when you continually hurt a population, any kind of population, 
you are going to see a disintegration of how they treat themselves and the people around them. But that's a byproduct of oppression and exploitation. That is not something that, it's not a, it's not a spontaneous thing that comes from within. It's a reaction to a situation or a circumstance that they are finding really traumatizing. So I hope that answers your question. Hi. Um, in your experience, at what point does a woman finally come forth and report sexual assault? And at that time, um, how do you think her credibility is looked at? Well, the credibility of women more generally is um, in the gutter as far as uh, legislators or police are concerned, the judicial system in particular. Um, I could get into telling you, <coughs> excuse me, all sorts of um, personal stories here to back that up, but I'm going to deliberately not go there because it's these are other women's um, testimonies that I'd be going into. But I will say that I have seen over and over and over, um, and I mean in the general population of women, this it's it's a complete unwillingness even to go forward because we know how we'll be perceived. And that's just a woman who might be working in a coffee shop. And there's all of this, you know, um, the the culture that we're in. Um, the She asked for a culture. How many drinks did she have? How short was her skirt? You know, we all know what I'm talking about here. So if you can imagine a woman in prostitution then being expected to come forward and lodge a complaint, that is many times harder. I walked into a police station when I was 16 years of age because I'd just been dragged around by the hair and slapped around the place. And, you know, it wasn't by any means the worst of the physical violence I experienced in prostitution, but just the mood he got me in. I'd had enough. I wasn't in the mood of it that night. It just infuriated me. So I got his car registration. I went to the police station and the young officer behind the, the desk, frankly, just laughed at me. He just laughed in my face. And... Here's the, the most disturbing thing about that, was that that young officer, he was only about 23 or 4, he wasn't trying to be cruel. He really wasn't. I could see in him that this was genuine amusement. So it was like as if somebody had walked in in a Barney suit or something, you know. He just, he couldn't conceptualise the idea that a woman who was in prostitution had any right to present herself with this information. And I just turned on my heel and walked out of there and I never went back to the police after that. Although there were many times when I most certainly should have been headed straight to a police station. So yeah, I think that um, the idea that there are parameters and boundaries that we are allowed to put on our sexual experiences when we're in prostitution, that is just goes, goes way over a lot of people's heads. Um, but I think that a piece of that a piece of that is about the toxic nature of prostitution itself because if you if you frame <clears throat> if we as a society frame prostitution as work right and we accept sexual access to people's bodies as a form of labor well then rape is theft of labor rape is theft of services and that's all it is and the the problem with that starting out from that framework, which is a pro-prostitution lobby framework, which has nothing to do with my framework, quite the opposite. They say prostitution is just labor. So <clears throat> as a consequence of their argument, then rape is just theft. And this is where, that's another one of the avenues, the in, in avenues of inhumanity that the idea of prostitution as labor takes us down. So we don't uh, accept that prostitution is labor. We say prostitution is compensated abuse. Have you seen any progression, uh, resources provided to women to enable us to come forward? In which, do you mean under which legislative model? Um, even just uh, phase one reporting, um, compassion, resources, protection. Have you seen well, any steps allowing us to feel a little more secure um, walking into that police station? When I got out of prostitution, um, which was 98, at some point, in the years after that, I'm not sure whether how many years it was, but I know that after I got out, there was a liaison um, between the police and the service provision unit that I mentioned earlier on. 
and the whole the whole point was a collaborative process so that they would work out a way that the police could um, relate to the women and the women could share their concerns with the police didn't benefit me at all of course because I was gone at that point but I was very glad to hear of it I don't see those as widespread I haven't seen them widespread all across the place what I do know is that in um, Stockholm they have social workers who work with the police they're actually in the police prostitution unit and the social workers liaise with the women and because the women in that country are decriminalized they have a situation now where they can pick up the phone to the police without, unlike women in <clears throat> the US, for example, um, who are simply arrested themselves. I mean, we passionately disagree with that US system. And it's, it's kind of irritating to me because as an abolitionist, I'm very often accused of being a prohibitionist, which is not the same thing at all politically. And what's happening in the United States is a prohibition model, which I think desperately needs to be overturned. Because under that model, you have a situation where a woman could have been raped or gang raped or battered or anything could have happened to her. And she can still be arrested, you know, which is lunacy. So I do think that those models, the kind of models that, that were kicked off in Ireland, those frameworks that are built up between the police and women in prostitution are very crucial. Yeah, for sure. I'd like to see more of them. Could I speak a little bit? Um, could I respond a little bit to your question? And uh, I'm not the only one who could speak to this. But I think that in uh, the, the city of Edmonton in particular, that we have uh, the community, law enforcement, uh, women, in, uh, both who, who are in prostitution and who are survivors of prostitution, have worked really hard over the last 20 years to create a different change. And I would like to tell one quick story, which only is just a tip of the illustration. About uh, six weeks ago now, our vice detectives and the RCMP CARE and two community uh, organizations worked together on what, what we call a hotel outreach, where, uh, where the, our law enforcement partners you know, try to make contact with uh, women whose ads are on back page, and where they also are looking out to see who brings the women. You know, is there a pimp, a trafficker, a boyfriend? What's, what's the situation beyond? And, uh, and then they meet with the law enforcement and with the two uh, organizations, the advocate organizations, and see you know, what help do you want in the moment. Well, one police officer said to this woman, if you ever need any help, call us. 10 days later, on a Friday at noon, this woman called the general police line. And she said, these vice detectives said, if I ever need any help, call. I need help. Uh, she had come under the protection, she'd come here on her own from another province, but while she was here, again, a common uh, technique is that those who are pimps say, come under my protection. I'll protect you when you go on back page. So this, she had gone under this person's protection, probably out of fear or force. He took all her money, plus he, um, uh, she was couch surfing and he, turned the person who was giving her shelter against her. So here she was from another province, no money. And she just wanted to go home. So she called the Edmonton Police Service and the vice, the com, you know, the people on comm said, we'll connect you with vice and the vice said, we'll connect you with one of our community partners. And then we were able to work together and we, were, we had her on her plane back home by 10 o'clock that night. That comes out of years of working together. So uh, I would actually like to uh, say that we have two uh, members of our vice unit here today, and I would really like to commend them because I, I, know, I know how hard they work, how hard they work to build those relationships of trust, how dedicated they are in, ter in terms of finding those who are causing the harm, and how compassionate they are in helping people in the moment. So I'd like us actually to give a round of applause. I'd also like to say uh, something else that I'm very proud of with the Edmonton Police Service. And again, some of our frontline agencies and women who are survivors of prostitution participate in this. Uh, there is a beat officer training. 
that uh, women are invited to, you know, educate the beat officers. There's recruit training. And uh, in that recruit training, it's a time for recruits to learn about diversity, about people in different life circumstances, about their own biases, and to go forward. So I, I think that we're working very hard in Edmonton to change that relationship, and we're seeing some positive results. Women now know that they uh, can be supported. If they want to testify against their perpetrators, we have um, court victim advocates who will go to court. We're having more women feel confident that the criminal justice system, the prosecutors, and the community will support them. So I'm uh, really, I feel very encouraged. We're in a different place than we were, uh, you know, in the 90s. Uh, uh, that would have been the response of the women and, and transgender persons on the street, that they were not supported by, by some of our law enforcement. Um, not all, but some. But that has changed, and that's encouraging. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, I mean, when, when you ask that question, it, you know, the way you, sometimes you'll get a question and there will be like a whole library that opens up in your mind of, of situations that you saw that should never have happened, that nothing was ever done about. And, um, excuse me, these lights are very glaring. Um, so, you know, I remember one young woman, like, she was she was battered, she was robbed, um, she was tied up, and she was left there. And when she eventually made her way out of the, the tape, um, she called me. She was a close friend of mine. I was the first person she called, and I went over to her apartment, and she was roaring, crying, and the place was upside down. They'd ransacked the house, and she was really, really hurting and, and just thanking God. She just kept, kept saying to me, thank God they didn't rape me. I really thought they were going to rape me. And I'm thinking it's, you know, these are the type of situations in life where, I mean, can you imagine a, a job where you're thanking God you didn't get raped and, and that's just a routine part of, of what you have to put up with. And she wouldn't even, cons and I didn't, I didn't think to suggest it to her. Like it, the idea never came up between the two of us that she would call the police, that was unthinkable. So we can't have those situations, you know. Um, so I'm really encouraged to hear that about Edmonton. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of program that needs to be rolled out mm -hmm. internationally. It's another question here. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> you were mentioning earlier that uh, prostitution is a problem that's a part of a bigger problem. And with that in mind, I wonder if you could comment on the relationship between commercialized pornography and prostitution. Well, I don't see so much that they have a relationship as that they're part of the same thing. Um, they're, they're part of what I would refer to as the prostitution machine and it has many different facets. Um, I've heard some people in my movement refer to prostitution or, or to pornography rather as just prostitution with the camera rolling. And yeah, I can see how people can arrive at that. Um, I think that's true as far as it goes. I, but I think it's more complicated than that. Um, I, when I was 16, I was asked to do films, you know, pornographic films. And um, I said just no, immediately, just this flat gut no feeling. And I interrogated that later on in life and wondered why was I so forcefully opposed to the idea of pornography, filmed pornography. Um, I, this came up when I was, I was prostituting in this underage brothel where you had to do um, photographic pornography as part of the work. So a man would come in and he'd do what he liked with you and he'd take pictures of you. And um, then he would go off and keep the pictures. And luckily for me, this was in the days predating the internet and predating, um, we didn't even have, we didn't have digital cameras or if we did, they weren't very popular. They would have been very expensive at the time. And this all sticks in my mind because the way that this system operated, um, the, it was actually that the roles of film had to be developed, you know, and I've often wondered who was in on that because these were all underage girls and they had to be sent off to, you know, a photography lab and developed. But anyway, I was asked to do films in, when I was in that place and, like I said, my immediate feeling was just, I just recoiled and there was a no way that was very, very firm. So I asked in later years, well, why was it? Look what you were doing every day. Um... You know, so why why did you feel as strongly as you felt about the pornography? And I gave it a good bit of thought, and then I eventually came to this feeling that what it really was was about it was about the nature of um, the nature of the the insult that was involved for me personally, because I felt that 
if I was prostituting for um, the sake of someone's pleasure, someone was using me for their pleasure, for their satisfaction, okay, well, that's sickening, but that's just about as much as I can handle. But I certainly wasn't prepared to be used for, for wholesale entertainment. And that was the difference. It was between the, the pleasure and the entertainment. I felt it, it would have cheapened me more to be used for that purpose. Um, and I, I'm sure that there's women out there who feel quite the opposite way for their own reasons. I'd say there's women who've done films who'd never... But I would say that that's the, that the crossover is not very... Um, it's not very... What's the word I'm looking for? There's a huge amount of crossover is what I mean. There's, I mean, there's tons of women who've done both. Um, and, and stripping them, I mean, that's an absolute gateway into prostitution. So all of these different things are interconnected, um, and very much so. I know a young woman who's prostituting on the, um, in the brothels of New Zealand right now who tells me that they have pornography going round the clock um, in every room, like all day, every day so that the pornography is part of the prostitution experience now in a way that it wasn't for me back in the 90s. Um, and what I find particularly heartbreaking about that story that she told me is she just finds it, she finds it so um, painful because very often the man will use her like it to replicate what he's seeing on the screen, which she hates, she finds extremely degrading. So she will always turn off the, the television um, in the hopes that the man will forget about it or not think of it. And she said almost always she's asked to turn it back on. So I've, I found that really hurtful because what that represented to me was an example of a woman trying and trying and trying over and over again to reclaim her dignity and not being allowed to do that. So, yeah, that's, that's a bit of commentary about those links. Thanks. I'm wondering, Rachel, if you might comment on the role of men in working to end sexual exploitation. I'm really pleased to see a number of men in the uh, audience tonight, and maybe about the role of men in Ireland, but the role of men around the world. That would be great. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that the role of men is crucial, and what we have to remember is that there's only a minority of men engaged in this if you look at the different countries around the world where this has been studied, the vast majority of them have only a minority of men, like 10, 12, 15, 18%. So that we're talking about a significant minority. But there's a much larger um, number of men out there who are either not thinking, not concentrating, not um, asking questions, not demanding answers, just having nothing to do with the situation and allowing it to just carry on. I'll tell you a little story. Um, and I think this really encapsulates, you know, why why men are important in this. I was in a bar with a friend of mine um, a few years ago, and she's she has, you know, shares the same history as mine, very similar, and she's also involved in, in abolitionist activism. And um, so she... We, we were in this bar anyway, it was about 10 o'clock in the evening, and these five men were sitting close to us, and they were roaring drunk now. They were well-oiled, you know? And there's one in particular who was just staggering drunk. And um, so we couldn't help but overhear their conversation because they were shouting and roaring and carrying on. And um, so one of them decides and announces to the rest of the men, oh, I want a whore, lads, I'm going to find a whore, and all this and he was, of course, the drunkest man there, you know. So, anyway, they, he found, the man sitting opposite him took out his smartphone, found a woman within seconds, um, and handed the phone back to him. So, um, he went off staggering out the door of the pub. And, you know, I knew from the comments that they'd made about where she was, she was only in an apartment blocks around the corner. So... I, w I said to my friend, I'm going outside for a smoke. I, was so, I just couldn't listen to it. I, I said to her, I can't listen to this. I said, I'm going to just freak out. Because I was expecting the four men left around the table to start jeering and slagging and making derogatory remarks about the woman he was going to use and women more generally, and I just couldn't deal with that. So I went outside to have a smoke. 
And when I got back in, she said to me, oh, Rachel, I wish you'd have stayed. I wish you'd have stayed. And she was so passionate about wishing I'd stayed. I knew, obviously, I missed something positive. So I said, well, what happened? What did they say? And she said, um, you wouldn't believe it. They kicked off this conversation about how they would never do that themselves. They'd no interest in doing that. They, And she relayed the conversation to me, and some of them were saying, your man who actually f found the woman for him said, yeah, sure, what's up with that? Like, why would you want to have sex with anyone who didn't want to have sex with you, you know? And, and there were different attitudes expressed, and some of them were about, like, you know, how wrong it was of him to do that, and some of them were about um, how badly you'd feel in yourself if you had to pay for somebody to, you know, if someone wasn't willing to, to hop into bed with you and have a good time, you know, consensually. Um, but all of them, all of those remarks expressed a negative attitude towards what he had just, just done, right? This is a friend who's just walked out the door. But at the same time, three of them were silent. There was five men. Three of them were silent in the face of this. And one even went so far as to facilitate it. And yet, the clear majority, four out of five, just thought it was the wrong thing to do. So I think that if, if men began to cultivate um, within themselves and within their own peer groups um, an attitude that very clearly framed prostitution as being abusive towards women, there'd be a lot less of it on the earth. I think men's role in this is very important. Uh, yeah, I have the mic, sorry. Um, hi. hi, thank you so much for sharing. I have a quick question. Um, I, I myself also support the Nordic model. Um, and as far, as far as I know, it has, it has been implemented in Canada now. Um, and there has been some criticism in the fact that it might uh, push prostitution more underground and also then make those who are in prostitution more vulnerable because it's less regulated. Um, and how, how would you respond to that? Well, prostitution wasn't regulated to begin with. Um, but aside from that, first of all, what's going on here in, in Canada is very close to the Nordic model. But it's not the Nordic model in the spirit or the essence of itself because it still criminalizes women in some outdoor situations, you know, where like they might be near schools or whatever. Um, there was a lot of talk in the abolitionist movement when um, C-36 was on the table about whether we should support it or not um, because of that clause, that contentious clause, really bothered a lot of people, including myself, because I just don't believe that a government is not viewing this as a human rights violation if they believe that a human rights violation can morph into something else because it's happening outside of school. You know, that is ridiculous. The obvious, I, I thought it was a nasty, punitive little measure on the women involved. And I thought if if the government wanted to protect schools and such, they just should have clamped down harder on any Johns that happened to be hovering around outside those schools. And I think that the problem is, there you go again with the disconnect about whether or not this is um, a human rights violation. And I think the problem is the governments just haven't arrived. They really haven't arrived at that point yet. And this is not. This is going to be a process. I mean, it's going to take many generations. I don't know why people believe that this institution and prostitution is not an industry, by the way. It's an institution that we have been living with for a millennia can be just solved overnight with some kind of, um, you know, a magical wand. Nobody's saying that the Nordic model is a magic wand. What we're saying is that it takes us in the direction that we need to go. Um, but as far as the, the underground accusations, which I've heard many times, um, I've never a single time heard an actual analysis of what underground is supposed to mean. Because prostitution is already underground in the sense that, you know, we don't have, um, in countries like my own and like yours, we don't have like multi-story brothels like you have in Germany um, and Holland and elsewhere. And I think that, you know, while people are criticizing the Nordic model, it's very bizarre to me that they're not, <clears throat> we only have three basic models to work with here. There's either the Nordic model or there's decriminalization and legalization, which are like Siamese twins, you know, in that there are slight differences in legalization and decriminalization in the way that they are implemented, but the way that they affect a society, which is what we should really be looking at, are absolutely identical. 
um, you have a massive expansion of the market. You have brothels getting thrown up. up to, There's 12, brothels 12 stories high in Germany. I mean, I've spent time in several of the German cities, and what I've seen over there would have to be seen to be believed. Um, in Holland, for example, you have tours of the red light district where under trees go free. That's how sick a society gets um, when they when they go down these um, roads that decriminalise pimping. I mean, we're all for women getting being decriminalised, just to repeat myself. I want everybody to be very clear on that. And I mean women in all situations. I don't, I don't believe that, you know, if you have three or four or five women prostituting together in an apartment or a house, that their exploitation turns into something else because they have company in it, you know? That's ridiculous. I think we need to keep our eye on the fact that this is a human rights violation at all times because as soon as we veer away from that, like I said earlier, we end up implementing these crazy policies that can't do anything but harm. Hi. <laughs> Um, what steps have you taken to help heal yourself or your spirit and um, to get out of like this out of the lifestyle and like a lifelong is it a lifelong thing or are you like done therapy or I think trauma I think recovering from trauma will always be a lifelong thing but by that I don't mean that you know you need to necessarily be going around on your hands and knees every day of the week feeling sorry for yourself you know I mean I have a, a good life and I have several people close to me who love me and and I'm you know I'm content in in several different ways but you know and that's where I'm at now but um I do believe at the same time though that trauma recovering from trauma is a lifelong process and it's something that just it's incremental and it's day by day when I got out of prostitution at 22 I, I was so depressed I spent about nine or ten months literally looking at the wall you know, I just brought my son to school every morning. I came home, I looked at the wall, and then I went and picked him up from school. And there was a lot of wall watching went on. And then after a few months, I started watching, you know, those crappy American daytime TV. I could, yeah, yeah. I graduated from the wall to the television. And, you know, it was, I was really low. I was very, very down. You know, it come off cocaine. I was 22. I had to accept the fact that, a good third of my life had been spent being used and abused by men. I'd been a virgin only a matter of weeks before I went on the game, you know? So uh, that sense of sexual autonomy and safety and, you know, all of the stuff that you should be able to feel, I hadn't got any of that. Um, and, you know, I, I hadn't had any of that, I mean, in my, my adolescence. Um, but, you know, I... I spent 10 years then, you know, educating myself, getting me, went back to school, like, um, you know, worked on getting employment and housing and all that stuff. And eventually, 10 years after that, I decided to really apply myself because I spent years writing that book, but I, I was writing, dipping in and out of it and coming and going from it. I wasn't like sitting in front of the computer screen and demanding of myself that I put in hard work to get it done. So I eventually did that about 10 years after I got out of prostitution and I ended up uh, almost having a nervous breakdown so I had to go and get counselling. I felt like I was just so, I was just hurting so badly when I when I insisted and demanded of myself that I write this out and get this out. And that was when I ended up in, in a lot of emotional, psychological pain. So I'd managed to keep a lid on that for 10 straight years. But it wasn't until I started unpicking that wound that I, I got very, you know, emotionally fragile. So I went and done a couple of years of counselling and I was grand after that, you know, for the most part. <laughs> How are we doing for time? How are we doing for time? Is there another question up over here? Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing with us. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to formulate this question, but there's something been percolating in my mind as you've been talking about something to do with empowerment and I'm wondering if you have any I don't even know how to say anything beyond that but maybe if you have any comments about yeah I have a few comments around that all right <laughs> we we hear a lot of that talk look you know um, sometimes I feel like we're living in in an episode in 1984 or something because this prostitution is 
the most deeply disempowering situation you can be in. You know, somebody pays to use your body, they pay to do what they want with you in an intimate sexual sense, or to you rather, with your body, as if you weren't even living in it. And this is supposed to be empowering, you know? I mean, this it's, it's disempowerment. And we're getting told it's empowering and it's, 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 it's degradation and we're being told that it's, it's uplifting and it's, you know what I mean? I've heard it so many ways that, that prostitution is referred to um, that actually present quite the opposite of the reality. And you know, we know that there's women, I mean, I'm quite honest here, I'm sad for some of the women that I have met, women who've picketed my um, conferences in Europe and stuff like that. And, they and I'm talking about girls 22, 23 years of age, some of them. And they come up to you and there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of belligerence and there's a lot of resentment. And I can see under all of that is what it is, is fear. Because them girls are feeling exactly what I would have been feeling back in the day if there had been a legislative model on the table that was going to impact in my life. I would have felt frightened. That no, I mean, and I would have been aggressive too, I'm telling you. You know, it's... It's only on. It's only a matter of. This is a matter of a time shift. Like if we were having this conversation twenty years ago, I probably would have been one of the most vicious, most belligerent young women you could come across. Because I'll tell you one thing: I would have been bald, furious, and resentful on the point that decisions were being made by people who were privileged socially relative to me. That would have infuriated me as a young woman who'd been homeless out on the streets. Um, but what I, I mean, so please don't anyone think that there's no sense of compassion on their side of the fence. We know exactly how these young women are feeling because that's how we would have been feeling ourselves. But the reality is, in, when it comes to this situation, what somebody would have needed to remind me of back then had that situation unfolded at that time would have been that it's, it's not all about you, Rachel. Do you know what I mean? Because we're talking about a situation where it's going to keep on rolling on and on into the next generation and the next and the next. If we don't try and contain it and diminish it and um, make sure that it doesn't run out of all control. Because let me tell you what's happened in Germany where they've decriminalized the pimps. There are now 450,000 young women and girls prostituting in the brothels of Germany. It, it has grown exponentially since the pimps were decriminalized and John's. And that's exactly what happens. I don't think that that's what any of us want. And I mean, some of the young women who are prostituting right now, they don't seem to understand that under, under the regimes that they are calling for, these are not easy regimes to be prostituted under. They're absolutely brutal. You know, I've spoken to women who've been prostituted in Germany under legalization, and women who, who are prostituting right now in New Zealand, as I said earlier on. And these are brutal systems. It's, it's, um, it's far beyond anything I had to deal with, quite honestly. It's like, I've, the women have described the conditions to me and they sound like something out of a bloody well abattoir. You know, it's, it's, this, it's like a production line. You know, you have enormous big buildings where, you know, 30 women in 30 different rooms. Um, this is New Zealand now. It's m on a much bigger scale in Germany. And you have, I mean, like, you know, in, for example, one of, the, and these, sometimes it's only in the, the small details that you can really get a sense of a situation. One of the New Zealand girls said to me, ah, oh, Rachel, they don't even use sheets in here, it's just spray and wipe. I says, what are you talking about? I didn't know what she meant. And she said, well, you know, like, we've got, like, you know, 10, 12, 14 men a day and a few dozen women, so you'd have the laundrette be going, like, round the clock, so we just... They have like a plastic rubbery kind of finish on the mattresses and you just spritz that down and rub it with a cloth after every man. So that's what I mean by this kind of um, conveyor belt um, machine type prostitution. That's what's happening in these countries. And I really wish the women who are prostituting right now, who are calling for these regimes, could see and hear what it is that we're seeing in Hearden because it is not pretty. Thank you. Can I just follow up? Um, I, I appreciate that very much. I was asking the question actually from the perspective of um, getting out, I guess. 
maybe you have, I was wondering if you had some, uh, from your own experience about, you, you at some point found your own power to find a different way. And I was thinking of it more from that perspective, although I really appreciate what you've said about from this perspective. Thank you. I'm sorry I misunderstood the question. I didn't <laughs> ask it clearly. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, empowerment. Um, you know, I think that that's, there's this kind of Hollywood version of getting our prostitution where everything is like, da-da, and you suddenly found your inner strength and, you, you, know, and, you know, everything was like something off of a movie. Yeah, you know, listen, I yet to meet him. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we'll say no more. <laughs> you know, I, I felt getting out of prostitution was just, there was no da-da moment. It was, it was just this sad, lonely, lucky escape. And it was heavily compounded by the sadness, I mean, by knowing women who weren't able to make that escape. Um, not all of whom are, are here now. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't that way, you know. And, and the sense of empowerment, if there is any, comes very, very slowly over a long period of time. I mean, as f I, I suppose the closest I came to empowerment was finally walking into our biggest bookstore and seeing that book on the shelves. Because I was thinking, yeah, well, you finally got there in the end anyway. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, maybe that was as close as I came to empowerment. But I have known and been lucky to know and to meet tons of women during these last years of my activism, women who've gotten out of prostitution and gone back to education, and a lot of them are working with, with women now, delivering frontline services, and they're doing tons of different forms of work, you know, around the issue. And that, I find, it, it, it always gladdens my heart to see that. Because so many women revisit the issue. They don't just, we don't all just walk away and move on with our lives. I mean. I, for some reason, and I think it's probably the depth of the injustice that draws us back. Women reach back for other women. I've seen a lot of that, and I've I've done it myself. Um, I had a particular friend who's who's passed away recently, who I really tried to help for years. After I got out of prostitution, there was no help in her. She was the addiction was was too deeply set in her, and she'd been in prostitution for over twenty years. Um, but you know. I, I think that that speaks to, yeah, it really does speak to the level of the, the hurt that women are dealing with here, that they're not prepared to abandon each other, that they go back for each other. You know, I've seen a lot of that. Uh, thank so you, Rachel. Um, thank you, Rachel. And I, I know that um, from direct experience, there are many women who survived who reach out for their sisters and, and brothers and transgendered persons. And there's the families who are reaching out for help. So in addition to individual empowerment, we have to look for where we all, as community members, that we can be empowered to walk with and to uh, create open doors. And I, again, I think in Edmonton, we've worked at that over the last 20 years. It only came about because women were knocking on the doors of others and saying, open up, we want to be in. We want to be part of this community. So I can really celebrate that we do have the DEXA Transitions Program. It's the only one in Alberta. And when we met with the Status of Women Ministry uh, before we came over here, we said, let's get a, 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 DEXA, a transitions program in every city in Alberta, not just Edmonton. We also have um, Kindred House, which is a first stop place, a safe place for people to just be able to come and be themselves and get some respite from the, the street. It's not housing, but it's, it's a safe place. We have several street outreach organizations. And then we have the community donors have come on board to help with other work. We're so fortunate, the Edmonton Community Foundation gives us $30,000 every year that we can then turn around and invest in bursaries. And this year, a, a woman who had made a lot of money off a book, um, she... It wasn't me, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> she... Just in case anyone's confused, right. but... <laughs> 
she, uh, I, I'm just kind of, this will be the first announcement of this, but she uh, doesn't live here, she lives in France, but she made the royalties in Canada. So she went to the Community Foundation, she said, I want to start an endowment in particular for Indigenous women. It's called the Awinita Fund, and she uh, has given cease of uh, the great treasure of being able to begin to disperse the, the endowment of funds every year. So this, this is community solidarity. It's, it, as, as women like Rachel and others reach out for their sisters, it's a community reaching out as well. And again, I, I know some people here are in the trauma recovery community and we thank you for walking with, with women. And I, um, I know that I'm forgetting uh, a number of things, but if, if I've forgotten some great work, I know that uh, there's some brochures out there on the back that show you some of the other work that's happening in Edmonton. And, oh, we have one more question. Okay. Okay, but I had another thing to say too. No, go ahead. So I'll, uh, you, the questioner can go first and then I'll, I'll, I'll begin to wrap up. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to thank you very much for being here, Rachel. I can't see, I can't see who I'm looking at. Where is it? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, since the Nordic model came into effect, I'm just going to read this because I get nervous. <laughs> uh, last December, which criminalizes pimps and johns, despite this, our city continues to give licenses to brothels and escort agencies, <coughs> which seems to be at odds with the new law. My concern is that this creates an atmosphere of normalcy around sexual, sexual exploitation of women and what happens indoors is somehow okay and more sanitized versus outdoors. What are your thoughts on this and how can our communities address this when our government seems to be indifferent or even complicit by giving legitimacy? Um, My, also, I, sorry, uh, also what do you think would be the most effective deterrent for demand? Oh God, um, well that's really simple. Um, you know, and what we, what we need to do is look at what it is that the men say, let the men speak for themselves. Because when you read the, um, the different research projects that have been done into the attitudes of men who pay for sex, you will always find the same things up the very top of that, um, that list of the different possibilities um, that can be imposed, the different fines and, fines and penalties. Um, and what it is that men feel would would deter them, and it's always um, having their their close loved ones find out, um, and uh, being put on the sex offenders register, which is exactly where I believe they ought to be. Um, prostitution to me is an issue of commercial rape. It's a particular form of abuse. It's not. Um, it's not enough to say, people, I've heard people say prostitution is rape, that's too simple for me. Prostitution is slyer than rape, it's commercialised rape. Um, but anyway, you had asked, um, well, what, oh, what's going on in this country with the, you know, like, how can you criminalise a pimp and a punter and then have, hand a licence over to them for the, for the establishment where they're going to be allowed to do their illegal activities? I'd be asking you, is the government smoking crack or what's going on? Because there's I'm not no. Sure. <laughs> there's, where's but the that sense is what's to happening. that? You know, there is absolutely no. That, that has got to be. Uh, it's one of two things. It's either a deliberate, deliberate ignoring of the law, or else they're smoking crack. It has to be one of the two. So Thank I would, you. No, quite honestly, there's, there's no way that a disconnect as blatant as that can be arrived at. Um, it has to be deliberate. So they, it's it's like the mayor in Vancouver who's also refusing to implement the law, which I find just amazing. I think it's going to take people in the community to get together and, and force the government to implement the criminalization of pimps and johns. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Well, actually, that, that uh, leads into a little bit of what I wanted to say. I did forget to say at the beginning that December 6 is an important day for two reasons in our country. One is the terrible massacre of 26 young women in Montreal, I mean, of 14 young women 26 years ago, simply because they were women. And we, so we have a national day of mourning set within this 16 days of activism to end violence against uh, girls and women. And the second is that on December 6th, the new law protection of 
communities and exploited persons came into act. And while there are flaws in the law, what it is attempting to do is to turn around uh, uh, our understanding of prostitution, which many people would, used to say was, oh, that's just a mutual exchange of sex between mutually consulting adults uh, into understanding more, more the harms of prostitution. Plus one significant thing for me is that the word prostitute is now removed from our criminal code. Prostitute was used to be there since before Canada was a country. Uh, women were arrested for, if they couldn't give a good account of themselves, or they're arrested for vagrancy, like being homeless. Uh, and there was, the, all the weight of the law was primarily on the women in prostitution, and that word is now removed. So we can begin to speak more about women as persons. And that's significant. So it's, it's a lot to turn around. It, this law has to challenge uh, cultural attitudes. It has to challenge a lot of things. But it, it's a beginning point. And again, as, as we've said earlier, it's definitely flawed. It gives me great pain that in, in theory, a woman could be standing outside of where our CIS office is and be, be potentially arrested. I know that's not going to happen in Edmonton, but it, the, the law provides that potential. And I wish that we would change that. I would also, um, I know we should begin to wrap up on our time. You've been very uh, patient at sitting for so long. I would like to um, just wrap up with a couple of things. One is that each one of us can do something and together we can do more. And I think we have some great initiatives in Edmonton. I would like to invite Mufti Mathewson just to come up very briefly and you've, you've noticed that this red dress has been sitting up here all the time. This is an example of what one person can do with, with her gift in life, which is photography. So I'd like her to speak briefly to that, and then I'll wrap up with a few details. Do you want to sit here? Or do you want to stand? I'm fine, thank you. I'll stand for a bit. Hello. Yes, they are bright lights, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> On January 17th of this year, I was reading the Globe and Mail in my pajamas in my living room and there was an absolutely elegant full page picture of a red dress hanging in the forest and beside it it said imagine if 1181 of your daughters never returned home and imagine no one cared and I thought to myself I care I really care but what can one 81-year-old woman do? And then I thought, I know what I can do. I can take pictures. I'm good at it. I've been doing it for a while. And so I started, I went off to secondhand stores. I bought red dresses. I put them in places that I thought would be possibly places of danger for women. Then I asked, invited other photographers if they would like to join me. One of them said, actually, the day that I invited people to come, um, eight photographers came out to, with 14 red dresses, hung them up and down the trees on our street, in the ravine behind the house. They all started taking pictures of red dresses in places. And one woman said, Mufti, I'm not taking places, just places of danger for women. I'm taking them in places where women are and won't go anymore because they are gone. And what you were saying earlier is, are there any pictures of, of women in this series that we have? And there are some outside. We now have 181 enlarged pictures. We still have 1,000 to go. You're going to see some outside in brochures of what you can do. But you, too, can do this. So if you feel like buying a red dress, putting it up, or if you have one, let me just tell you about the red dress that is here. It belonged to Kara. King. Her mom is here. She saved the dress after they found her daughter's body. So this dress belonged to Karen King. It's a very, very special dress. If you too can help by just raising awareness, I cannot tell you how much I have learned in this year. I take my hat off to you. I take my hat off to Treaty number six area that we are. I'm learning so much, and I thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Mufti and Kathy, and uh, everyone who's trying to do something positive can, can be as simple as sharing love with uh, children in your life or smiling at someone on the street. Um, can go from that simple to the political. And thank you, Rachel, for um, taking us from the personal to the political in such candid, open, challenging conversation. And I, um, I just want us all to keep, keep working away wherever we can to change this world so that it is a safer place for all of us. The one little bit of housekeeping I have is if you could um, kindly take uh, any coffee cups or lunch um, bags out. I, I think there's garbage cans outside. And the other is that uh, Rachel is happy to uh, sign some books and Brittany is going to make some space on a table outside uh, the door. Thank you for taking this time out of your lunch hour and your work hour and um, we'll see you again at another event. Thank you Thanks. Thank you.